Hey folks, um, welcome to the podcast. I had um, an awesome chat with one of my best buddies, Dr. Lee Bofkin, um, and we've known each other for coming up to 25 years, and we've had some like serious life chats and a lot of fun. We ran festivals together, done a lot of cool stuff, and it's great to see one of your mates doing something that they love. Um, and so, yeah, we talked about his business, which is Global Street Art, uh, they do hand-painted advertising, amongst other things. Um, and it's interesting to hear how he found out what he loves and how he made it into a business and had the courage to, to follow that. Um, so really interesting, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Boom. Boom. And we're live. Are we, are you, is that your new catchphrase? Are I'm in. Catchphrase? Yeah. Boom. We finally made it, man. Made I got it. you on the podcast. Um, it's lovely to be here. Great to have you. Great to have you. We've been chatting about crap and business and life for oh, like we've been doing business 25 together. years. For, for, for so long. Like, we do festivals together. We do, you know, when we were, how old? That was 2009. So First one was 2009. So Crazy. Before we hit 30. Three festivals, Secret Garden Party. Yeah, we, yeah, we did that too. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Fantastic. All that times. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's chat about your business, graffiti, street art, all that good stuff. Let's do all of that. But first, yeah. what is the difference between graffiti and street art? Uh, so, well, I mean, there's a lot of definitions. So, graffiti and street art are both forms of action that happen in public space that may or may not be authorised. When you talk about street art or graffiti, you're talking about an art form, a crime, and a subculture. So both of them can be separate art forms. Graffiti is more letter-based writing. It has its history roots 40, 50 years ago, writing on the subway system, outside the subway system from Philadelphia to the New York transit system. Street art came later as an artistic culture, and it's a whole hodgepodge of visual influences put together. Basically, So it started in the US? started in the US. Graffiti did. Modern, modern, the roots of modern graffiti did. Um, but they have their histories. People have been writing on walls, you know, obviously everyone has the Roman examples, etc. But writing outside, public space, public art, mural movements, all of these things have got, uh, they come and go in cycles. So the cycles of basically mark making, making art in public space. Uh, and they, they happen in, in every culture, you know, the Egyptians painted their houses, all of those kind of things. True. One definition that happens is, uh, that's quite common is street art is that stuff that happens outside that's not graffiti. So there's a visually distinct identity uh, street art tends to be more figurative. For more, example? Uh, well, so graffiti is, you know, one definition of it. It's a working definition. This is me saying it. And you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different definitions. But it's um, writing your name, your letters, your chosen letters, uh, again and again, to get up, to be outside, to be seen. Um, and it's about doing that ritualized process over and over again. It's not, there's, there's, there's gang graffiti, which is about territory, which is a completely different thing. And then there's artistic graffiti or writing, which is which is being going as far and wide as you can to get up, to get your name known, to, to, to basically get fame yeah, in yeah, that yeah. subculture. Yeah. And then street art is something a little bit different, um, but it, it also has a kind of a legal background. But all of these things have developed, evolved, they've churned over, and there's a modern mural movement and street art festivals that happen all over the world uh, that m- most of them didn't exist five years ago, 10 years ago, and certainly not 20 years ago. So, you know, it, it's constantly in flux and art movements, all of them are usually defined in retrospect. What's going on today? And at the time, you've got people that came from a street art background that are doing a graffiti background that are doing more street art. And it's all you know kind of churned together. Yeah. But if you're a graffiti artist, you want to do it as a career and make money. Mm-hmm. Then you make the transition to no, street art. No, not necessarily. Art. I mean, you know, if you want to make a career out of a form of urban art or be it street art uh, or graffiti or urban art there's an aesthetic that goes with that there's ways of doing it a lot of people involved in say graphic design uh and and just painting murals just painting outside there's people that do that you know just paint outside big walls murals uh, offices interiors uh, advertising all of those things okay. uh you know that, that's just it, it's often easier to think of it as painting and it depends on the purposes of the conversation <laughs> yeah what's the public perception now Public perception is mixed. It depends in country to country, but it's a lot more open than it used to be. Social media has had a, a, a big impact. Most of the street art that uh, all graffiti that people see today is not really on the street, but it comes through their Instagram feed, their Facebook feed, whatever social media. So it's a, kind of a shared 
visual thing and because people share the stuff they like more the stuff that people tend to like more gets to be seen more yeah yeah and so it's yeah, kind yeah. of over the last 20 years it's converted 15 years it's converted more fans and so more people have become fans of street art fans of graffiti and as the the movement's grown up and the fans have grown up the fans are you know now in property companies working high up in councils in regeneration and redevelopment all of those things and so there's become more of an acceptance of those kind of aesthetics and so there's more of a place for them a role for them in uh, you know making public spaces place making yeah yeah and is and is the is the public perception different in different parts of the world yeah absolutely i mean it really depends you know when i broke it down before and said if you're talking about street art and graffiti it's crime an art form or a subculture there's certainly wide differences uh, in how graffiti is treated and punished the illegal stuff uh, is is thought of in terms of the law so um if you uh, you know there's there's well-known examples of uh, graffiti writers who've painted trains in this country having l- long long jail sentences that seem totally crazy and when you compare that to different countries in europe <coughs> the uk seems more punitive uh, and then so what's a typical at, jail sentence uh, i've had friends who've been sentenced for a couple of years really yeah crazy for like painting the side of a train and yeah well re- repeatedly it's typically <laughs> not a one-off thing but um you know I, I, there's also but then there's also kinds of graffiti where it's just viewed as like a almost like littering and you just get a fine if you're caught and on the spot sort of fine so it kind of depends if you're you know where you're doing it and and from a legal point of view uh the key differentiator is usually permission fine and so you started global street art and one of the co-founders of global street Art. one of the co-founders founded it. yeah fine fine um what is it global street art is an organization that exists to live in painted cities so we're mission driven that's what our mission is to live in painted cities uh, and we achieve that in three different ways. So we've got um, an online uh, platform, globalstreetart.com, with all the associated social media. We've got roughly half a million fans on social media. Artists sign up to our platform, uh, share their photos with us, and we in turn share it with our audience. Uh, and that promotes street art and street artists online. The second part of what we do is we just support art and artists. It's non-commercial, uh, uh, and it's when artists are looking for places to paint, we basically match them with spaces, just find spaces for people to paint legally. Um, yeah, and, and, and increasingly as we grow and we're able to help provide materials and, and sort of support in different ways. Nice. So you started out. And the third thing. Go on, go on. <laughs> Sorry, I nearly <laughs> forgot to. Uh, we have an agency. So globalstreetup.agency is where yeah. that's online. Fine. And that looks for commercial opportunities for basically monetizing painting. So that includes things like campaigned advertising, um, brand, uh, working with brands, sort of content and partnerships. Uh, working with property developers, that placemaking I alluded to before, and then other small bits and pieces like licensing, interiors, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. And so in terms of how you got into it, it's interesting because every like month I was calling, I was like, Lee, where are you? <laughs> He's like, oh man, I'm in like Sao Paulo taking yeah. photos of graffiti. Yeah. I'm in like Sydney. And yeah. so it started out as an interest. Yeah. Well, it started and then... out as an accident really. So, I mean, street art and graffiti, I, I used to, Breakdance or b-boy to give it its, its other name. I used to I used to breakdance for the UK back in around 2005. Uh, I, I I had an injury. I was in a competition. I did a somersault. I landed badly. I hurt my knee. I had to sort of stop dancing overnight. That, that felt terrible at the time, but in retrospect, it was really good luck. It just didn't seem that way because it led me down a different path. So because I had all of that energy, I had to do something with it. I started photographing street art and graffiti when I was traveling, when I was going anywhere. And that became my obsession, my new hobby. I uh, just I threw all the time into it that I could. And then on my sort of academic career side, I was a scientist. You know, my PhD is in uh, maths and evolution. I was a biologist, basically, until I was about 25. Uh, and when I left that, uh, because there was a maths element to it, I was lucky. I got offered a job in LA. I said, sure, I'll come out there working in finance. And I'm perfectly frank, it was terrible. Um, uh, I really loved learning, but I wasn't so good at the spreadsheets and that sort of thing at the time. Um, I just didn't have the experience in business to really be so useful in that position, but it taught me a lot about, you know, companies, business, corporate finance, accounting, that sort of stuff. Um, but because I was in LA and I was working with this, this, this company that would every four months give me a new job, send me to different offices. Uh, I, I, I traveled a lot and kept taking photographs of, uh, street art and graffiti, it was a lot more graffiti at the time. Street art was just graffiti in like under bridges and in parts of town that you 
wouldn't usually go to and I really enjoyed that exploration yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I was going to like the city centers where you tend to get more of the street art and that was only possible because my uh, business partner co-founder Conrad we met at that that finance company he basically uh, you know thought there was something in this and it was his idea I can't take credit for it um, and you know he's, he's been um, still a mentor immensely supportive over the years um, helped give us that runway to figure out what we could do to become sustainable over time nice because um, most a lot yeah. of people like want to do or make a business out of a, out of a hobby mm. they find it very difficult to do so mm. and actually quite scared it's quite hard to quit a well-paying job yeah make a move from science to finance to i mean hell, I i'm going to just go and take I photos no <laughs> i was no good so i was lucky it wasn't you know I, well to be honest when i left uh finance at times 2007 there was the credit crunch so there just weren't jobs to go into so i was forced out of the industry um, which again felt pretty rough at the time. So just didn't know what to do. Uh, joined a good friend of mine, Adrian, for a, a really crazy startup that was somewhere in insurance and living in Spain. And then it became a tech company. And and it wasn't something that I was really aligned to, but I was I really loved the people I was working with. Uh, and I was in Spain, so every weekend I could go to a different city, photograph four or five hundred pieces of graffiti because Spain is really well painted, and I really really loved that. And then at the end of a, a, a few months in Spain, working with Adrian, uh, I just had a sort of revelation. I thought this has been so much more fun. This is, I'd love to do this. I wonder if, you know, people will take a chance on me to, to, to travel and just do this for a summer. Uh, Conrad was fine with it, my business partner. Adrian said, look, if this is your passion, go and pursue it. If after a few months, you're not, you know, you, you want to come back, it's still there. So people really made it easy for awesome. me. And that's yeah. just luck. Like, you know, I, I can't pretend that I would have had the guts to do that had I not been in, in that really lucky situation. And then, you know, after we had 60,000 photos, I classified that database from 25 countries like a scientist would. So you could look up, you know, smoking monkeys or pieces painted on vans and all sorts of cross-referencing. Um, we thought that maybe we could try and be the Getty images of street art and you could license images. It turned out we were opening a big door to a small cupboard and that there wasn't really a business there. And what we learned by trying to do that was the rights who owned the rights and photos were complicated and you should always have and work with artists to that end. And it just felt complicated. So we started, went full time, really without a business model at all but with enough support to try different things and keep pivoting until something worked. So you had some, so you had enough cash and runway to just classify the photos and then just experience and see well, what comes up. I was classifying the photos while I was doing other things. Yeah. So I'm still working on that. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're going to build up something from a hobby or passion, it's quite the challenge to just cut ties with whatever you were doing, take no salary and then move into it. It felt safer to me and I think probably a lot of people to build something up on the side. So essentially you're working kind of two jobs for a while. Uh, and then, you know, eventually when you've got enough of a signal that you think there's something there, that's when you take the jump. And when did you start to like formalize the business model? So the social impact, mm -hmm. profit, looking after the artists? Yeah, I mean, uh, it took a it took a two to three years, I'd say. So we tried, we thought about making iPad apps. Um, people were paying for those at the time, but the partners that we found weren't quite right. They really wanted the rights in the images that we couldn't give them. Um, and then we tried book publishing and we brought out a book, but of course it made no money at all. Um, Still was, available? So, uh, I, I think maybe like it's, it's, uh, it's called concrete canvas. It came out, I think 2014. I think you can kind of get secondhand copies off Amazon. There's not many copies out there. Uh, it, it feels like a history book now when I look at it, um, it's still out there somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, then we tried gallery shows, but I realized we didn't, the artists that we were working with at the time whose careers have moved on a lot now at the time they, their work wasn't necessarily selling for as much as it is now it just wasn't as popular they were early in their careers and we just didn't know people that would buy art so we tried it and the gallery model is quite difficult because unless you know people that you can place the art with you're putting all of the effort into making the show incurring all of the costs and then you try and sell the art and maybe recoup and hopefully profit it's a difficult way around to do it with the model that we have you know, if, if you contract a client for a project and you lock that in, you know what you're going to get paid. You can work out your, hopefully some of your margins, you know how to pitch for that business. And then, um, then you just got to go out and do it. So your reputation and your execution becomes really important, but at least you know that you can make some money up front. So that, so the money now is the hand painted advertising. 
Um, that's so, that's part of it. Yeah. So hand painted advertising is, is a bit more than half, but it's by no means what we do completely. Um, the the partnerships with brands, which is really like making content stuff that goes online, working with artists that way. That's another part of it. And then a smaller uh, section of the business is, is working with property developers, working on big murals. You know, there's different reasons why uh, different parts of that work at different yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And then the social, and then the social, um, the social impact is you've met, met all these artists struggling to make money or want to try no, and monetize that. Not necessarily. That. Like, they're, they're separate, right? So the social stuff that we do, since 2012, we've organized, helped organize uh, about 2,000 legal street art murals. That's just because that's part of our mission. Now, no, you know, organizing 2,000 murals takes a lot of effort, nowhere near as much effort as the artists put in, because we're just saying, here's the space, here's what you need to know, here's, you know, go have fun. And, and now we can film it if it's during the week. So you supply the pain and, and like that. Yeah, yeah, increasingly we do that. And we certainly try and contribute to it pretty much every time um, and, and, and whatever else. But when we started, it was just about helping artists find places to paint. And that's about reducing the administrative burden. What I mean by that is, let's say you're busy, you're working a nine to five, you're working five days a week, you've got a family, you want to paint on the weekend, not in the same old places, but in some new places you don't know where, but you haven't got the time to look for them. Or you're a, a, some, an artist who comes from another country, you're looking for a place to paint, but you don't know the law, you don't know where you can paint. And actually a friend points you to us. It's a beautiful thing when someone comes into our, our studio and says, uh, you know, and we can say, look, here's a place to paint, here's the paint you need to do it. Welcome to London, you know. There aren't public facilities that really cater for artists in that way. And there's a few people around London that really try and help artists find places to paint. And is this a key, like, new trend that's developed over the last few years? So I mean, like there's public... definitely increasing organisation around uh, street art, and there's more organisers, and, 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 uh, and that happens all over the world. I think more people have been involved in that, and the more folks have tried to turn that into a business in one way or another, or had a business and decided to do that stuff on the side. Um, I, I'd say that's a trend. I, I think it's it is de it's definitely a global trend, but it's still very small. You know, I think when we're talking about sort of street art and where it could go and what painted cities might look like, you know, in London, less than 1% of walls are painted. Right? Really? Not, I think <laughs> yeah. so. Like, yeah. not when you think of the construction sites, very few are painted. When you think of, you know, uh, plastered, rendered walls, gable ends, not that many are painted as you go around London. It really varies neighbourhood by neighbourhood. If you're around Shoreditch and maybe Camden and parts of South London, around Brixton, maybe there's more, uh, 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 there's more walls painted, but it's still not an overriding amount of it, right? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. there's still a long, long way to go, not just in the UK, but globally as well. Fine. And how, how do you think the industry has changed? Since you've started? Well, I guess um, I think you, you have to be careful when you use the word industry. Like, what is the industry? Are we talking about uh, the brand related side? Are we talking about the raw advertising side? Are we talking about the gallery side and the print production side? The, the short answer is it's all changed. A lot of that's been fueled by social media. Generally, I'd say it's increased, but with that, there's also increased competition. Um, you know, I, I think some brands dip in and out of it some clients dip in and out of it and it waxes and wanes as if it's uh, fashion but that trend is sort of on top of an underlying trend that our cities are being painted more uh, generally there aren't so many competitors that we have out there that i'd even say that we can in the uk really call it an industry yet i'd say it's more of a proto industry yeah you know yeah. we're we're i think by far i, I think we're the biggest you know group of sort of commercial painters yeah, out there yeah, yeah. in the UK by a country mile. Um, you know, I, I, it's, that's, but, but I've seen more people be involved and do things over time. It just, it just is what it is. And you see those trends happening around the world as well. Yeah, On yeah. the advertising side, hand-painted advertising is how all advertising was done. You know, vinyl printing, print and post, the 48 sheet billboards, those were that kind of scale of outdoor advertising is kind of 60, 70, I don't know, however many years old. Um, and that movement back to some of it being painted is really just finding those traditional techniques, working again with sign writers. You know, that's 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 an old industry that's found a new sort of lease of life. And do you think that's um, like driven from technology? You mentioned social media, think, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, it's a good question. So there's there's a bunch of trends. Um, I think at the same time as social media helping show the craftsmanship that happens in painted advertising or 
helps artists sell their work online by giving them direct connection and access to their audience and bypassing the gallery system. There's there's a heap of other trends as well. Like there's a return, the idea of a return to craft. Return Which is? To, well, return to craftsmanship. So in a very digital, cold, technological age where we feel more alienated by social media, people, I, I, I'm not quite right to say, you know, want something more real, but want something tangible, something that's done by hand, something that feels like, effort has been put in instead yeah, yeah, yeah. of being mass produced and manufactured so that happens at the same time as well you know i, I think within you know sort of the commercial realm and with brands they're talking you know story <coughs> storytelling is a is a thing now, yeah, yeah we did a yeah. storytelling course yeah yeah we did right, yeah. right um so you know that that kind of narrative you know people yeah. don't like to have uh, um products shoved down their throat if there's a reason that something is relevant to them, it's a story that goes with that, yeah, it yeah. reaches more people. Yeah, for sure. Um, for so sure. all of these things, and those are just some of it, you know, yeah, I think yeah. um, if I'm, if I'm honest, like m- murals are a relatively inexpensive way to change the way a neighborhood looks. And for know, sure. if, it, yeah. if, if you want to change the way that people feel about being in the neighborhood, change the way that the, the neighborhood looks and, and painting it's relatively a lot cheaper than knocking a building down and starting again and, and, and other you know, no, it's interventions. Great. No, I mean, there's some, there's some murals being painted near me. The mm. annoying thing is when, it's, is when a graffiti artist graffitis over it. That's the most buddy. annoying thing, man. That's life. <laughs> you know, you can't go... I think there's something beautiful about that as well. Like, you can't control what happens in the public realm. True, true. Um, that, that churn, that, that, that graffiti is what keeps things fresh and incentivizes people to repaint stuff. Of course, I've been really frustrated when things like that happen, but yeah. I think it would be desperately sad if we lived in a city that didn't have any graffiti. No, no, you're right, you're right. I think it also changes. So, you know, it's, 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 when you know people that write graffiti and you know their name and you, you go around a city and you don't see a tag as a, as the same thing. You say, I know that guy, I know that guy, or I know that guy. And even if you don't know the people, if you start recognizing it, it can make a really cold city feel a bit more familiar yeah yeah. you know i think um that's true but at the same time you know everyone's had work destroyed and and it got painted yesterday and then it was ruined today and i think you know that's frustrating of course but then you do that you you repeat that whole process over years yeah and you just become kind of ideally a bit zen about it yeah what'd be interesting to see is is if in, in, in our public spaces if more are open to be painted mm. whether less people are graffitiing illegally uh, and they're using like these public graffiti spaces and people are always going to do that but i think it's very easy to dismiss people that paint graffiti illegally as not wanting to paint in different ways some people are just you know at the hardcore level of just illegal 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 um you know there are going to be people that just want to paint in that way but there's a crossover as well and what you can definitely say is if you give people no legal opportunities to paint all you can do is the illegal stuff and you have a city that ends up looking a bit like Paris, which some people like the look of, but, you know, uh, 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 but that's, you know, a lot of people um, that don't know graffiti really have an objection to that. And, and uh, if you've got more spaces to paint and a culture that uh, fosters um, artistic expression, you get a different outcome. Yeah, that's true. Back to social media. Sure. So you've, you've hit Instagram hard. I think the last look you've had, what, 250,000 followers or something like 230,000. that? 230,000. 230,000. Fine, <laughs> right, 10%. Yeah. Um, have you, I mean, how have you gone about it and, and have you really seen a, a benefit to the business? That's a good question. Um, you know, we've been posting for years uh, and street art is really shareable content. It's all organic growth. There's no paid for promoted growth. There's no bots. There's none of that stuff. It's just sharing good art with people that want to see it and they like it and then it, 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 it grows from there. Um, our group isn't necessarily the fastest. There's accounts that, that post you know, really, for want of a better word, like virally stuff. Well, as in like sh- street art related stuff? Well, or... they'll, they'll call themselves street art related and they'll just post clickbait. And, you know, that, that's a way to grow an account as well. We've, we chose not to do that. Um, has it really benefited the business? Um, I, I wouldn't say we get many inquiries from it, really. Um, I think it's, it's something that helps people understand that we're serious about promoting it and so maybe it gives us a gravitas yeah yeah, uh, yeah. it's part of that whole wanting to support street art and artists that mission of wanting to live in painted cities yeah yeah but i yeah. wouldn't say much business comes from interesting so why did you spend so much time doing it it's one of those things that you kind of started <laughs> it's just like <laughs> and, an ego it thing an it's like hey no, i've got to no it's like it builds an audience and and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's one of the ways that supports the mission right so 
if you want people to believe, well, it, there's, there's three audiences, right? Um, you know, there might be the client audience, but I don't think they necessarily respond so much to that. But then there's definitely artists uh, and then there's definitely fans. And for the yeah, artists, yeah. we want to be promoting them. So it matters to us to promote them and it ma- and it makes a difference to what they do. So, you know, clearly there's a value in doing in doing that. Definitely, yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, fans want to see it as well. And the more fans that you make, the more people see how good uh, just painting outside can be and the impact that that can have on a space and, and have people really believe that, then, um, you know, the, 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 it gets you one step closer to your mission because you're changing people's views. Yeah, that's true. And so you're sharing photos on your database artists that have contributed to work artists we, views for advertising yeah we, we we share a few things so mm, a lot of the content that we share is uh things that artists have uploaded to globalstreetart.com then we also share a lot of things that we've helped organize as well and do, do artists just upload because they've heard of you and do you encourage people to upload their own stuff or? um we don't do much promotion i think the site's been around for a while it's actually it's pretty old and clunky we're looking at that um excited to say that there will be a new website out in the next few months um hooray yay uh, um don't copy ours <laughs> sure, I, 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 i'll try not to um you know so so um but it, it serves a function so yeah if you've seen things in our social media and you're an artist and you want to be promoted as well a natural thing to do would be to upload your stuff there yeah um yeah. to global street art now some artists also use global street art as a portfolio page because they can store their other social links um, you, you, it's amazing that, like, for example, Indonesia is one of the bigger countries wow. uh, of, of, for artists on on, uh, on globalstreetart.com, and that's amazing. So, how, how come? Have you done any promotion? Or? No, not at all. I think, you know, it's probably a few influential artists picked it up, and they're like, oh, this is cool, and then maybe someone got shared, and then there's word of mouth. One thing that's really beautiful for, for us is globalstreetart.com is like the far reaches of our relationships. And artists that have maybe uploaded their pictures a few years ago and we promote it online eventually come to London and they say, hey, I'm coming to London. Um, you know, have you got any spaces to paint? Hey, we'd love to see you drop into the, the studio. And, and, and we make real friends that way. Wicked. Um, and, and that's happened a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot over the years. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, a, it's, it's another reason to keep that up. And is that and that's a free service for artists? So you never can, charge an artist to, yeah. to, to find a space for them. No, as in as in, so they can upload their portfolio. Oh yeah, yeah. On, you mean on on, the, on website. the website? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I can't see why we would ever charge for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's about support, and I think you know if you can engineer a way, you've, you've got to think about where the money is and where it could come from. And if that is better off coming from the brands, and you can do that, and you get to. Um, you get to do the other things that further your mission on the side, yeah, yeah. Um, and it supports that. Then you know you're 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 you're, you're happy. Yeah. And you're using Twitter much? We do use Twitter. It's obviously it's an older audience. We've got about forty five thousand followers uh, on Twitter. Uh, we've got at Global Street older Art. audience age wise. I think so. I don't know I don't many know. young people that jump on Twitter these yeah. days. There's new social media apps all the time. You know, obviously it was it was about Snapchat and. There's a new one out that's called TikTok. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's no. really popular among really young, really young users. And there'll be other social media platforms that grow and change over time as well. So you use Instagram and Twitter there? The main Instagram, team. Twitter, no. Facebook, we've got 145,000 fans on. Tumblr, we've got about 35,000 fans on. 10,000 fans on Pinterest. And uh, and you can catch me on the street corner shouting to. Nice. Mate, you're hitting it hard. You're hitting it hard. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so how have you seen um the city's changing for street art if at all like a uh, city's welcoming street art again it varies city by city um i'd say generally globally yes cities are more open to different forms of street art and they're not all the same the walls that anyone can paint at any time um legal walls they go up and down i'm not sure if there's an overall trend for those uh, and in london i think it's probably gone down slightly over time really of the formal official 24 seven ones wow. that anyone can go and paint at any time. For what um, reason? Uh, there were never, there weren't a huge number of spaces. Some of them have kind of been redeveloped over time. Uh, some, and, and actually I think development has probably been. One so of what the these spaces ones. were like old They'd estates like or old ball courts, yeah. um, you know, uh, tunnels, leak street by, you know, uh, Waterloo, Waterloo. And that's yeah. got a BGen program going on now. And that's changing quite a bit too. I think it will last for, a long time but but um i think development 
is, 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 is a neutral word. It can be good or bad. Regeneration and, and gentrification are two sides of the same process. It depends how the local community is yeah. uh, fares after that process happens. Uh, and those legal walls have tended to be uh, not last so long. At the same time, there's been uh, an increased number of people helping artists find places to paint. Yeah, yeah. And then there's probably right. been an increase in the number of tolerated spaces where it's probably not completely formally permitted, but, um, you know, it, it, which does carry risk for artists. Yeah. Um, but, but generally people historically have been okay for painting these spaces. Yeah. And then there's an increased number of, no, I wouldn't even say, well, of managed spaces where it, it's the curate, not really curators, but facilitators. So someone so, owns some land and. Yeah. Or like someone comes to us and says, right, right. Place here, here, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those kind of spaces have increased. There's also been an increase in the number of big mural spaces because of various projects and, and, and thoughts. So that's typically projects. what side of a building? Side of a building, two, three, four stories high, something that requires scaffolding or lift equipment, one of that sort of stuff. There's been uh, certainly an increase uh, in the last five years in those spaces, but um, in the 1980s, for example, and, and before, there were, London had a really rich community mural scene, and most of those uh, murals were were, were lost again when development knocked the walls down so again it comes and goes in cycles we tend to be pretty myopic pretty short-sighted looking on murals and street art in a very short time frame but you can look at mural movements over 20 30 40 years easily um and 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 uh and see those cycles coming and going again so the environment's constantly changing for artists the environment the the streetscape is constantly changing full stop like cities neighborhoods uh increase in uh, in popularity they wax they wane you know london is obviously an increasing increasing population uh people still moving to london it's kind of you know you look at the old photos of the traffic on the m25 and you're yeah. you lucky you know it just london's a busier bigger expanding city yeah and so it changes from a development point of view a traffic planning point of view you know, from lampposts that came in the 50s, you know, there's postal lampposts is a, is a, and manhole covers are things that I might <laughs> pointlessly, you know, the more you look at street art and you're attuned to what's going on in public space, you start to pay attention to other things as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's, yeah. A, you know, there's a fast, there's a road building program uh, for London in the 1960s that never really happened, uh, but it was on the cards for quite a while and a few buildings were constructed with the expectation that there would be this road building program that never happened and you can still see the scars on the landscape so if you were like planning our new towns and future of our towns and cities mm. how would you integrate street art into them well I, th- I think it's part of a broader question architects uh, and master planners typically city planners i think typically create spaces of a, a view have a vision of spaces that they impose in sort of a top-down way there are efforts and they are somewhat changing that uh, that there should be an allowance for sort of some bottom-up process, i.e., you know, what are people, not just what do people want in terms of uh, how would people change the space? Yeah, yeah, how yeah. would the flow of people change the space? How do people want to interact with that space? And how do you build for that, design for that, or design space for that to then be accommodated after the buildings have happened? It's hard uh, to do that, though. It is. Um, you know, I, I think... It's only something like London where, you know, we've got... That hundreds of years of history and stuff's just built on and built on and yeah. built on. Yeah. Uh, and that, that will keep happening. And, yeah. And the, the buildings from today will be torn down at some point in the future as well, as well. You know, a lot of the skyscrapers that we've built, you know, huge buildings, I think it's quite doubtful whether they'll be there in 50 years time. Quite a lot of them will be pulled down. A lot of the brutalist buildings from the 1960s, most of those have gone now. Yeah, so no, it's true. It's true. what it is. Like the, so, so how would you get art into public spaces, like how right you get now? Art into public spaces, um, I think you have to speak with the right people. You have to first thing is you have to make a case for the value. Uh, for me, there's a community value in in not just making a space brighter, but encouraging people to slow down, to stop, to rest a while. And only when people, uh, uh, if you're running through a space, you never meet anyone. If you're stopping to have your lunch, you know, be that chess benches or better places to sit, et cetera, and less cold architecture. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. encourage people to speak with each other by facilitating that those accidental meetings might happen and communities build and form that way if you add up those interactions. People make friendships over time. So you have to design a thing. It, you know, you call it a people-centric point of view. Yeah, design. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably beyond the way that I think or my, my current core, you know, it's yeah. beyond what I know. Yeah. <laughs> but is, any, is, anywhere, is anywhere you've been doing it well? 
like Singapore have these connected gardens that you can walk through around Singapore. Is there anywhere that's like taken up your motto of painting, making every city a painted city? And mm, it's so difficult and it's so conflated with other factors, right? So I think if you step back, it's it's street art is or painting is one aspect that makes a city potentially friendlier, warmer, more welcoming, makes you want to slow down and stop because it's a shared good, it enriches the space, it's public art, it's things that everyone can enjoy. Uh, there's other things, you know, from the, the, that are needed. And culture, other things from a spatial point of view and street furniture uh, affect how people move through and what yeah, it looks yeah. like. But culture is really important to community forming as well. Yeah. Is there an expectation that we stop and speak with each other, that we help each other, that we do those kind of things? And I think art for me is about fostering that kind of spirit as well that, that sort of community no, definitely, spirit definitely. Too. Um, and, that, and then fit, go on. where is doing it really well yeah the happiest people on the planet are usually are, are often the danes so yeah you know is it like bhutan one of the happiest places or something i don't know it's probably because they you know I, I think bhutan probably bhutanese people probably spend less time on their mobile phones i think so they don't have anything <laughs> chill out yeah. mountains relax i don't know i think often i feel like i could I could I could spend longer outside of the city. It'd be interesting just to measure if like you have a different response to art if you see it on a wall compared to art if you see it on your mobile phone on Instagram or Facebook or yeah I'm, I'm sorry for the, the noise but uh, yeah 100 percent I think um you know although we're constantly on our phones and taking selfies and out taking photos outside for me something that that I don't take many photos on my phone because I find that being outside and taking things in is uh, a mobile phone ruins that experience for me. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not I'm not so interested in in photographing a lot of walls and taking selfies in front of walls because I think it it takes something away from being there. Um, for 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 sure, it's better to see something in person than it is to for see sure it on your mobile. Phone. But most people are seeing life through their mobile now. Well, a, a lot of, but also if it encourages you to go and be somewhere and go and see something because you've seen it on your mobile. That's phone, also true. It yeah, can yeah. work another way. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Your technology is, is 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 neither good nor bad, really. It's it's really about how you use it. Yeah, it's very powerful stuff, uh, and it's you know obviously there's uh, billions of pounds and dollars that have been invested in the attention economy and in 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 making you want to look at your mobile phone, uh, and a mobile phone is really good at that. Yeah, it's, so it's awesome. You know, it's your phone, clock, alarm clock, yeah, watch. Yeah, there's a bunch of art installations a few years ago which was strapped together with a luggage strap, everything that your mobile phone has taken over. So, you know, alarm clock, radio, camera, yeah, yeah, TV, I saw that. all of those things, all in one is now in your, in your pocket. Didn't you, I think you posted a photo of like, you know, the alien scene of like the alien, like encapsulating in your face, sucked, you know, that, yeah, you know, alien film, alien. I know the alien films, yeah. on your face, the arms behind sucking up the face. We, we probably and that's your mobile that. phone. It's like, yeah. Yeah. it's interesting. So, um, so it sounds like you're, your focus is UK in terms no, of like this. Not necessarily. I mean, are you organizing uh, like stuff in other countries? Yeah, or? we're working in Abu Dhabi today. So we've got a project going on out there. Um, we've got a couple of projects coming up in Rome in the next couple of months. Great. Um, we do work all over the world. I think, you know, the, the majority of what we do is in the UK. Yeah. Um, but we're global street art. We certainly promote artists from all over the world. We've got friends in lots of different countries and that gives us a capacity to do things in other countries as well uh it really depends on what clients are asking for yeah and what do you hope to achieve with global street art ultimately Oof, uh well, the big question um a permanent bricks and mortar museum dedicated to, to to preserving a visual record of street art and graffiti a community and with that make it a, a community hub yeah uh, so like a kind of like club or whatever where people can come pay and you know, share I've got, experiences. I've got, I've got a floor plan. On Have there. you? Yeah. I've wow, it's some serious plan. stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and there's multiple things in there. So yeah. there's 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 lots of different things to have that in the same building. I don't want to give too much of that away yet, but Fine. more than our office and studio currently are. Yeah. That's nice. I like that you'll bring it into the physical world. I think it has to. Actual... But also, like, you know, we we organised, helped organise a few years ago, the Broccoli Street Art Festival. That was a rewarding experience. Uh, so what is that? It's a street art festival in Broccoli, South London. Right, we, yeah. we ran a uh, had an idea for a um, an article. Uh, we 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 we've never been. I've never been very good at filling in forms. We tried right. to get arts council funding years ago for uh, uh, a street art festival, but I I couldn't fill in the form to save my life. I, 
but my phone number <laughs> where the postcode goes. Like, it's not one of my strengths is filling in forms. Um, and, and so we tried to apply for Arts Council funding for Street Art Festival and we flopped. We just didn't do it. Oh, well. to run it yourself? Yeah. Well, yeah. What, the Arts Council could maybe fund us. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was one of the last times that we saw any sort of public funding because it's just not something I've got the skill set to apply for. Fair enough. Yeah. And we haven't thought about bringing that on and really doing that so far. Yeah. But um, we spoke with the Londonist. Uh, Londonist is a, is a really cool website. I'm sure you know it. Um, and, and, and they were supportive of the idea for an article that was nominate your neighbourhood for a street art festival. Uh, so we ran the article, put a few friends up to it, so we awesome. didn't look totally silly. But in the end, there were quite a few neighbourhoods that were like, we want to have a street art festival. Seven neighbourhoods came forward in total. Broccoli won a public vote with about, I think it was 900 out of 3,500 votes. Nice. And so we went down to Broccoli and said, right, we're going to have a street art festival. Uh, nice. We do. <laughs> Uh, a room full of really interested people that wanted to see it happen. Was this outside or? Uh, yeah, it was, it was about 20, like 25 year olds in yeah, Broccoli yeah. and around Broccoli in South London. Nice. Uh, three or four years ago, and that's now run itself independently yeah. as a street art festival since then. Um, but we'd love to see uh, a, a London mural festival. Nice. We've been thinking about doing that, you know, how to fund that and what that looks like and access to spaces it's really complicated yeah yeah um it's really no, it's doable though 100 yeah. percent. you know i can't i think one of the things about being knowing so many talented artists who paint outside is that you can reimagine a city as a gallery yeah. one of the the programs that we have that we're most proud of is called art for estates we've worked in like four or five different housing estates we're active in three housing estates this is all in London? or um, All in London. Yeah. Uh, the three active ones are all in the borough of Camden. Um, right. Camden's been really helpful, super supportive uh, o- o- over the years. And we're sort of figuring out a process that at no cost to the council or residents helps get more art into housing estates in London. Normalises normalizes it so kids grow up around art, uh, you know, makes spaces a little bit brighter. And at the margins, I think it's a good thing. It, it has solved some antisocial behaviour problems. Uh, some kind of awesome. littering is one thing that yeah. comes down. Um, doesn't solve everything at all, but you know it's a good thing to do, and we'd love to do that more and more and more. So you're giving a lot of artists lots of opportunities and platforms to paint. Are you? We're help. I'd say we're helping, helping them to doing it. to find a place. You've got to be really careful about the language, and, I, and I'm really careful about the language because when I think about, especially our community or social programs, I think of what we do as an important one percent. So we're we're helping artists find the place to paint. Uh, and, and just making the administration a little bit easier, that's the 1%. Yeah. The person yeah. that then goes on to make it look amazing and put their time and effort into yeah, it yeah, yeah. is the artist. And are you, are you? I mean, look, artists have, I think, a big duty to society. They're painting stuff. And I feel like a lot of artists... Uh, uh, yeah, would you not agree? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm not saying... Well, anyone that's operating outside has got a duty. Or to, you know, you need to be aware of the environment that you're painting in and yeah. the effect that it's going to have on the people around you. Yeah. I think the only reason that I object before letting you finish the sentence and my apologies for that is I also think society has a duty to, to support and, 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 and foster artistic practice. It That's works, true. It yeah. works both ways around. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you have no control over what these people are painting. Right. So like if they want That's to promote not... a political view or. Mm. So, so it depends. Right. So in the art for estates program, this isn't, it's not a commission. You're, you're helping artists. It's, if you come and paint in Shoreditch, Maybe a piece will last a week, two weeks, three weeks, some amount of time. Yeah. If you paint in a housing estate where it can have more social impact, you have a different experience on a better structure of wall. It's a fresh space where it's valued and appreciated by the folks. Uh, and it, and it, it's just a different experience of painting in London. And I think a, a, a wholesome, grounding, beautiful thing that can happen. Um, uh, I forgot your question. No. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> No, Too on, many of them. So, no, so basically, look, artists paint things for different reasons, oh, right? right? Control, control, control. So it's no, like, me, yeah, go, go on, go on. Um, so we're not, in, in, in art for estates and anything, we're not telling artists what to paint. Yeah. If we're telling artists what to paint, as far as I'm concerned, that's a commission, you're paid for it, it's commercial work, that's how we operate. Um, if we're facilitating an artist and the request comes from an artist, then we're doing what we can to help and support the artist. That's different from us telling someone to paint here, now, this, that, the other. That's a commercial thing. Fine. But what we do say is, especially in the housing estates, you know, we, can't, we won't tell you what to paint, but tell you to be sensitive, what not to paint. Like, shouldn't yeah, yeah. be racist, shouldn't be blah, 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 shouldn't be sexist. Yeah, you know, it doesn't happen. 
And we, you know, when you trust, it's so rare that there's ever been that kind of problem over the years. When you're trusting artists uh, 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 to do what they want to do, uh, most people want to say something, say something meaningful or do something that's not that aggressive. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but but that said, artists should be able to paint political stuff. Absolutely. Well. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. difficult if you're standing between a property developer who's got a building site hoarding and an artist and you want to make a statement about, I don't know, housing or Trump or something like that. Yeah. And it might bring a council complaint and you find yourself in a sticky situation and you try and navigate that. And from time to time, we've we've supported some biting political works. Uh, and they haven't really. All, they, yeah, they haven't all gone well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what the person who's built board it was was like. I've had I've had council complaints from developers once or twice that right. hey you know there's a, a Trump on the wall you can like that <laughs> right. so it's kind of you know and some of that stuff is like you know uh, again you're just a bit zen with it and it just makes it really funny yeah, yeah we've 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 had some projects that where some of the things that have gone wrong or some of the things that have happened just seem bizarre and you're like how is this my job and <laughs> you know and at the end of the day the fact that you get those stories. If you're thinking about it in the right way, you leave with a deep sense of gratitude. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we're doing something, and I, I mean, me and our team and the people around us. I mean, I mean, you know, the global street, the, the core team, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the crew, if you will, we're able to do something full time and, and just pay our bills. Yeah. Doing something that's freaking amazing. Also, awesome. you know? and all the things that I've done in the past, from you know, sciencey stuff to working in finance, it's like there was cool stuff, and I learned a lot, but. You know, I was doing HIV research at one point when I was a, a scientist. I never thought then that I could have as much social impact doing that as I think we can have now. Wow. Uh, and, and that's because you're painting outside, it affects people. And if you paint, if, if, if something great goes up and people pass it on a bus, you know, you, uh, if it makes the people on the top deck of the buses journey half a percent better for a week until they're bored of the mural and they maybe want to move on or whatever that is, you know, you've, you've really done something, you, you, you know, and, and that's worth doing. Definitely. Great place to end, man. Are we done? I think we're done. Cool. Unless there's anything else you want to chat about. Uh, no, I really enjoyed it. I think I, we're done. I, um, nothing else. It's great to hear, uh, it's great to hear you enjoying it and people doing things that they enjoy. I can't see myself doing anything else. I'm, I'm one of those people that you, you speak to that guy and you're like, ah, he's a lifer. He's going to be doing that for as long as he can. Mate, life's a long time. Life is a long time. I mean, who I, knows? I, I, yeah, exactly. I who mean, knows? But of all the things that I've done, I've never enjoyed anything as much as this. And I can imagine if we make it that far and we get the building and all of that stuff works and we're able to support artists in more ways. That's really cool. That yeah. I'm going to be in my 80s and 90s uh, uh, shuffling around the office late at night, clearing the bins. My Man, official. You'll my be official giving. You, you'll be giving me a job behind the bar, <laughs> like. My, and... my my job title for, for years was uh it still is it's ceo and janitor you know i think there's a there's a i spend a lot of time sort of emptying the bins because it's still an entrepreneur still a young company that's still what you got to do yeah, yeah definitely definitely it's awesome cool man thank you keep up the good work uh drop off a piece of art whenever you want boom and yeah <laughs> boom <laughs> see ya hey folks thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places